Morning, everyone. Who rocks? <laughs> well, we are uh, starting, as promised, a new series today, and we want to. We've entitled this series "Shift." Everyone say "Shift." We want to talk about in this season of Lent, kind of shifting some things in our lives. And today, <laughs> I want to talk to you about looking specifically at. Um, kind of our eating and drinking. Have you ever noticed, like, I don't know if this is, I'm sure this isn't just me, uh, but I've got, and I thought it was because I was getting older, but like when I go on vacation, uh, I'll be eating breakfast and I'll be trying to plan. Like whoever's with me, we're discussing what we're eating for lunch while we're eating breakfast. And then you start into lunch and you're trying to figure out what you're eating. And then of course there's snacks in between, right? And then there's the late night eating. And that's just, that's interesting, isn't it? But that's vacation, right? That's, that's how uh, vacation is. So uh, there's a lot of planning that goes around our eating. There's a lot of uh, things that, I might have to wear my glasses. For some reason, my eyes are a couple hours behind. Anyway, um, yeah, so that's how it is. There's, there's this vacation. Claire and I, earlier this week, we were with Doug and Adele Calhoun, the, friends of ours that we wrote our, this book, this last book with, and um, they live in Boston, so of course there's the fish, right, and all the clams and all that jazz. And um, the one thing I, did, I like about people, where you, when you go where they live, they think you know everything about where they live. Like, well, there's the clams. And I'm like, well, I, I'm sorry, I wasn't sure about the clams, but now I'm even talking to you as though you should know about the great clams. But they are great. Anyway, so we spent a lot of time. We were there for 48 hours, essentially, in Boston. And uh, we spent most of our time talking about what we were going to eat next. So I find that happens a lot. Uh, you know, uh, people from around the world will say Americans uh, are kind of known when it comes to our eating. We have three meals a day. Uh, then we have, of course, the coffee in the morning. Uh, these are generalizations, yep, coffee in the morning, blossom and sun roast. And then you have like a, a, maybe a donut or a, a biscuit or whatever you do with that. And then there's snacks in between meals. So there's the three squares. See, this isn't really normal around the world. It's normal for us, not so much around the world. Um, then maybe some people have, you know, uh, their, their preferred beverage before they go to bed. Whatever it might be, that's America, and that's how we're looked at. We are culturally, um, we, we, we just spend a lot of time around food, around planning, and around thinking about it. Uh, we kind of merge appetite and hunger together. We think that appetite and hunger are one and the same. Um, and obviously, that creates some issues for us. So culturally... Um, about three quarters of Americans are considered overweight. And part of that is because the access that we have, just culturally, and we also have this culture that just tells us whatever's available to you, you just do it. And that's kind of our freedom and right we feel. 30% uh, of the children in elementary schools are considered overweight. Um, a family of four in the United States will uh, throw out approximately $1,500, the average family in America, $1,500 worth of food that they never touch. So they sit down for dinner. We all throw things out at times. Um, that, that equals about $1,500 worth of food a year. So if you want to save some money, just eat everything on your plate. Um, I don't know if that saves any money, but maybe eat, I don't know, figure it out. And then there's... Um, the average American, all of us, this isn't just per family, this is the average American eats out 18 times a month. That's a lot, right? That is a lot of eating out. So if you want to start a restaurant, that might encourage you. Anyway, um, we have this culture of food access, right? And at the same time, we have this idolatry, idolatry towards body worship. That's the culture we live in, and you see this. Uh, when you go to the grocery store, and you're, a good example of it is you're in the checkout line, and on your right is, uh, or your left, whichever, on one side are these magazines, and they got all these people with like six-pack abs, and they're, you know, all airbrushed and all set up, so then you kind of feel like, gosh, I should look like that, because that's what people in magazines look like, and then right next to that are all the Snickers bars and stuff like that, <laughs> so we're, we're a little bit confused, so we got, we got the accent. 
And then we have this idolatry and this body worship that creates problems for us. So we're indoctrinated in it. This is, this is uh, what has created this culture of our bodies in some ways being master of our life. That food literally has a power over us that most of us don't, if any of us, don't care to admit. That if we sat back for at least momentarily and thought, how much power does food have over my life? Now, there's also what psychologists call this thing, uh, it's called the pressure, pleasure principle. And this, is, this used to be a phenomenon that they said was mainly with middle schoolers and early high school uh, young people. But now they say it's just a cultural phenomenon for pretty much everybody except for when you're really little. It's just if it feels good, you, you, you do what feels good in the moment. So the access is what psychologists call the pleasure principle. So we, we don't take a lot of time uh, to pay attention to these things. Now, uh, what that does is it possibly, according to scripture, is keeps us from the authentic pleasure, the, the holistic pleasure that God may have for each one of us. Now, uh, I wanna talk to you for a couple minutes about fasting. And right away, somebody's like, oh my gosh, who talks about fasting in church? Uh, it's going to be us today. Anyway, um, fasting is an old, ancient practice, and it's very biblical, and I'll talk about some of those things here in a minute. Um, but let me just give you some, just a brief church history in a couple of minutes. So fasting uh, was taught in the Old Testament. Jesus fasted. It happens in the New Testament that when the church starts, there's a lot of fasting going on. Uh, it was normal in the early church for people to fast two times a week. So two days a week. Uh, it, it generally was Wednesday, Friday. They, they stayed away from Saturday, Sunday because uh, Saturday was Sabbath back then. Sunday was a time of celebration, so you wanted to just enjoy. Um, and there were even like the Pharisees and Sadducees and some of the old religious practices, their practices were... Um, were Monday, Thursday. So the reason that the early church went Wednesday, Friday is we, you were just kind of, we're like that. It's more holy to do it on different days. And it didn't look as religious, even though it was the same amount of days. So that was really a part of the fabric of the church till really about the 1700s. But along the way, somewhere in the Middle Ages, uh, the whole practice of fasting became extremely and intensely religious. Now, we've started the season of Lent. It's this 40 days that leads up to Easter, right? And maybe some of you had poonchkis on Fat Tuesday. The day before Lent starts, you go out and gorge yourself because that somehow is holy. You go out and you eat like whatever. And then, you know, from Wednesday, Ash Wednesday on till Resurrection Sunday, you're going to behave yourself. Well, back when Lent was first in Instituted, which was a few hundred years after the church started, um, it was a literal 40-day fast. They would fast all day long, uh, no food or drink for 40 days all day, and then at sundown, they would eat or drink, and then they'd start it over. And actually, some other religions have copied that, so to speak, um, where they'll go for 40 days and they'll kind of have that similar pattern. Well, that's where that came from. And then what happened in the Middle Ages is it got so, it became so legalistic. And there was also this piece where our bodies uh, in the Middle Ages weren't considered a holy part of our life. Like our bodies were almost evil. Uh, and that you get a lot of weird theology in the Middle Ages around you know, sexuality and things like that going on and uh, uh, that, that even sex itself was evil and then the body, you know, they took the scripture like where Paul says, uh, I, I buffet our, my body in order to put it under subjection to Christ. They just said the body's evil. The body is like this necessary appendage, but ultimately we're just spirit beings. Well, now we know that that's not that's not good theology, that our bodies are an essential part of who we are in Christ. So taking care of those things, um, it, taking care of our body is important. So what happened was there's this tremendous pushback for a while, um, starting around the 1700s against fasting because it's just like this religious thing 
that's not helpful. However, I would say this, that the scripture clearly tells us there's amazing benefits as a spiritual practice of fasting in our lives that I think the enemy has tried to rob from the church because it's gotten out of whack. What God is speaking about when, in scripture when he starts to talk about fasting and prayer isn't talking about some legalistic activity, but an opportunity to open up space in our lives for God to move more powerfully. Sound good? So it's with that um, that I want to start this. Also, let me say this. Those of you that are already feeling like I have never fasted, I feel guilty already, I feel like this is going to be condemning, maybe I've even already said something to you that feels like a weight. Um, I would just say to you, over 98% of the people in the church in America do not fast regularly. So we're all kind of in this together. We all, we all, the invitation here is just where can we grow and take our next step. Wherever you are today, the invitation is just for you to be closer to Jesus uh, as we move through this and then go from here, right? So Matthew 4 uh, chap chapter 4, starting with verse 1, the scripture says this, Then Jesus, led by the Spirit, everyone say Spirit. I love that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Do you think? <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. Makes sense. Anyway, the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. In this, this, this context, this is the temptation in the wilderness. It goes through verse 11. I'd encourage you this week to spend some time around Matthew 4, 1 through 11, but we're just going to stop there uh, for the moment. Anyway, so uh, one person put it this way, said fasting is the abstaining from food or some other deprival of one's flesh, about the flesh in a minute, in order to fill that space with the sufficiency of God. Fasting is the abstaining from food or some other deprival of one's flesh in order to fill that space with the sufficiency of God. In other words, fasting is to deprive my flesh. Now, flesh here, what I'm talking about is not your body. It's your flesh is that interior part of us that has, it's, it, it kind of, uh, com it's where our desires and our, our urges are. It's where this, this, it's just kind of our interior. Interiority, so to deprive, and it's it's the thing that says to us, "I'm just going to go after whatever I want." It's that that can be our flesh. So it's to deprive that and to feed our spirit. So that's what fasting is about. Uh, one person said this. I love this uh, statement. He says, "I only have so much hunger, so I want to make sure that the space there is space for some of my hunger to go toward God." See, because we have many things as Americans, don't we, to satisfy our hunger. We've got a lot of different things. So let's talk about the benefits of fasting for a few minutes. The first benefit of fasting is that fasting connects us with God's sufficiency. And there's a lot more benefits, but these are the ones I, I feel like I'm going to have time to cover. The second one is fasting can increase, can, everyone say can, fasting can increase passion for God. The third one is fasting can break enslavement, and fasting can bring greater spiritual sensitivity. So let's jump right in here. So uh, fasting, some of the benefits is fasting, first of all, can connect us with God's sufficiency. So we just read that scripture in Matthew 4. What you need to understand is Matthew 4 there, Jesus' temptation of the Christ uh, in the Jesus' temptation in the wilderness is a, is a story that is a reflection of an Old Testament story. In other words, Jesus, as he did several times throughout his life, uh, deals with something that didn't happen or happened improperly in the Old Testament. He fulfills it and shows his sufficiency. This story, almost every theologian would tell you, this story is a reflection of the book of Genesis story 1, 2, and 3, where Adam and Eve fail. 
All right, Genesis chapter 3 says it this way. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say you may not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will surely not die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows when you eat, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, also desiring, desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. Everyone say ate it. Ate it. And she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Say he ate it. He ate it. <laughs> Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves, and Ralph Lauren makes a lot of money because of this in Genesis 3. <laughs> Have you ever thought about, uh, in this story, about the, the, obviously, I think we all think about the fact that there's something that's eaten, but do we think about the fact that there is this hinge pin in this story that revolves around food, and then Jesus deals with it again in Matthew 4. Now, obviously here, Matthew or uh, Adam and Eve, they fail in, in this temptation to eat, even though there were other things to eat. But God was asking them to limit their eating, their intake around certain things, and they had to have the whole thing. So they went for it. What happens here is, first of all, there's an inversion that happens. Later on in chapter 3, uh, actually, I'm sorry, it's at the end of chapter 2, God promises all of us, mankind, womankind, humankind, promises us dominion over animals, plants, the earth, over the harvest. God promises us dominion uh, over livestock and fruit and trees, Okay? But there's an inversion that happens. So even though they had dominion over that thing they were offered, they allowed an inversion to happen, which the enemy tempted them with, where they gave up their dominion over the created things that God gave them dominion over, couldn't hold that in check. So that's how original sin starts. See, what fasting does is it begins in our life to clearly enforce God's divine order. The scripture tells us men and women will rule over animals and land and plants and trees and fruit and livestock. But there are times possibly where we give up our inherent right in God. And we need to take it back intentionally. See, in Matthew 4, Jesus shows up on the scene and he's tempted with bread, a picture of fruit and livestock and trees and plants. And Jesus doesn't take the bread and he proves himself sufficient in our insufficiency. See, unlike Adam and Eve, Jesus succeeds. Unlike you and I at times when we come to these things, Jesus succeeds. Unlike the billions of people on the planet now, unlike the billions of people on the planet before, and probably unlike the billions of people that will come after us, Jesus succeeds. So Jesus shows us his sufficiency in all things in Matthew 4. Around food is where he starts. It's around a decision. Will I eat instead of fast? See, this is how Jesus opens his kingdom work up in the world. He opens it up in the world with three practices. These would not be the three practices that we use. If we were going to try to expand a kingdom, we would probably think like, well, it's going to be Bible reading. It's going to be, you know, let's, let's take up an offering. Nothing wrong with that stuff, right? Those are all good practices. But Jesus goes in a different place. It's kind of a weird place. Jesus begins his kingdom ministry with solitude and silence, the practice of prayer, and fasting. He fasts for 40 days and 40 nights to show his sufficiency in all things. 
This is how Jesus begins the adventure of opening up the kingdom for us. The second thing we see is that, it, that fasting can increase our passion for God. It can, again. See, Jesus later, and this is really the only time in Scripture some would say that Jesus specifically taught on a spiritual practice clearly. Matthew 6, verse 16 to 18, it says this, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they're fasting. Truly I tell you, they've received their reward in full, but when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So I said can increase our passion for God. Now, first of all, there's a couple of assumptions that, we, that Jesus makes in this scripture that as he's speaking to the folks there and speaking to us, two assumptions are made. The first one is, that we'll all fast. It's just an assumption from Jesus. Jesus doesn't say, if you fast, if you get around to it next year, Jesus says, when you fast. He makes the assumption that everyone that is in pursuit of him will fast. And the other thing in this scripture that I love, because it's so true about me, I don't know about you, but Jesus assumes that we will fail in our attempt to fast that we'll do it improperly at times, and we'll mess up. And I love that about Jesus. Now, there are bad and inadequate reasons for fasting. They could be beneficial in some ways, but this isn't really the kind of fasting that Jesus was talking about. When it comes to fasting, like here's some bad reasons. Weight loss and fitting back into your old clothes that have been hanging in the closet for a while is not a good reason to fast. There might be benefits to that, but that's not really fasting to get closer to God. There could be budgetary or money savings by fasting, right? You can do that. Some like to fast to get attention. Have you ever been around somebody that was fasting and like, see how Jesus here, he says, you know, wash yourself up, take a bath, clean yourself up, put something in your hair, look a little better than you do. Anyway, you ever been around somebody that was fasting and they're like, you know, the dinner table's getting set and they're like sitting over in the corner and you're like, are you, are you hungry? And no, Satisf I'm satisfied in the Holy Spirit. I'm like, Really? If that's satisfying in the Holy Spirit, I'm backsliding because I don't want any of that. <laughs> fasting was not meant to get attention. That's not the point in it, Jesus is saying here. Some think that when you fast, you get God points. It's kind of like frequent flyer miles, right? It's, it's Marriott points or it's, you know, it's Kohl's cash. And you can, you can redeem that for cash and prizes and rewards. Somewhere down the line, Jesus will owe you because you've built up points for fasting. So many points per meal. Anyway, some of you could really cash in, right? It's not good. It's a bad idea to fast for breaking up with somebody. Young people, those of you that are single, don't blame God. Don't go to somebody, your, your, your person you're dating and say, I feel like the Lord's leading me into a season of fasting, dating you. <laughs> that is not God's decision. That's your decision. If you want to fast dating somebody, don't call it a fast. Just say, I'm breaking up with you. It's interesting. I, I just tried to give somebody some ideas, I guess. Anyway, so here's the thing that happens uh, when it comes to this issue of trying to get attention, for instance, is self-denial often invites a desire for recognition and acclaim in all of us. There is that temptation. That's part of the temptation, is that we would be noticed when we're doing something that we're kind of happy about doing even. But what Jesus is saying here is that in itself is its own reward. Basically, you got yours. You already got your reward. However, what, what we're really talking about is we're invited when we fast into deeper levels of intimacy with God. Not just to show somebody else that you're fasting. Now, I want to call something out that I think is important, a precaution that I think is important for us to call out. 
in this midst of this conversation around this encouraging one another to fast and paying attention to the scripture. Because of the body image issues, especially around adolescence in our culture, it requires some precaution. Because of eating disorders, body image issues, practices that can become health problems for us, it requires some wisdom and sometimes some corporate wisdom. Maybe talking to a parent before I go to fast or a spiritual mentor that I know can give me good counsel and, and that I wouldn't be led into something that would become the trap of the enemy for my life. So it's important we pay attention to those around us and how they're even entering into this uh, as, they, as they pursue fasting as a spiritual practice. Benefit number three that I want to talk about is that it breaks enslavement. In Isaiah 58, 6, which is a whole conversation in itself, but let's just stick with this verse 6. Is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Now, Fasting breaks enslavement in our lives and the lives of the people around us. It has that ability to do that. Here's the thing. Enslavement is simply this. Anything that I have, that I have to have, is enslavement. And whether it's food, whether it's beverages, whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs, whether it's pornography, money, fame. I mean, just go down the looks, whatever it is, go down the list. If I have to have it, it becomes enslavement. And if I'm enslaved to anything, it's God's desire to break me free from that. See, what happens when we fast, when it comes to this issue of enslavement, is we pick two very specific fights. Don't kid yourself. If you go into fasting, the first fight that is intentional that you're doing is you're about to fight your flesh. You know, that old nature, the sin nature, your false self, that part of you that just desires to do and is tempted to do the things that you and I just want to do. You are asking for a fight with your flesh. That's why it's hard to fast. That's why it becomes difficult and you have to pay attention to what's going on in your life. And it's a time to move toward God. See, in this place, we fast as an act of repentance and agreement on God's will for my life. I must decrease, John the Baptist said, who was a great faster, and Jesus must increase. We must deal with our inner veruca. Do you guys remember Veruca? How, some of you are old enough. The original Willy Wonka had, I don't know if the newer one had a Veruca, but the original one had, remember Veruca? I want my chocolate now. No, daddy. I want what I want and I want it now. And if I don't get my way, I'm not going to be happy about it. That is the part of all of us. Look at your neighbor and say, you must deal with your inner Veruca. That is, a part, that is a part of all of us bent on rebellion against authority that comes from God. It could be that part of us that wants, doesn't want to do what God desires for our life. It might, be, it might be rebellion against the authority of Scripture. It might be rebellion against the authority of a parent. It might be uh, the, the rebellion against the authority of a teacher or simply rules in itself, or just a verse of scripture that we wrestle over. I have to, my, I, I set a warfare to break the enslavement of my life in my flesh, first of all. And then secondly, the enemy of my soul. See, your battle and mine, the scripture says, is not against flesh and blood. Fasting sets up a war directly. That's what Jesus is doing in Matthew 4, hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy. The battle is not against flesh and blood, but by this, I intentionally and you intentionally align yourself with God's desire for your life by intentionally aligning yourself with God's ability because there are those spaces, and certainly when it comes to our hunger and our appetite, this is one of those areas that God needs to help us in. 
Jesus said himself, he said, some things never come out with, except with prayer and fasting. It was on the heels of the disciples who were great apprentices of Jesus, great disciples of Jesus. They weren't perfect, but they were in pursuit, right? And they go to pray in Matthew 17 for this little boy who's demon-possessed and throwing himself in the fire. And Jesus says, when are you guys going to learn? It takes more than that to overcome the enemy here. This is demon possession. This requires some prayer and fasting. I remember when I moved from one school to another, I was uh, from like middle school to high school, I was having a lot of contention with some guys uh, that uh, I was going to school with. They were kind of from the other end of the spectrum with how my life was going, and I'm sure they looked at me that way and constantly trying to, like, start fights and stuff, and I'm not a fighter, I'm a lover, and anyway, (laughs) that was a joke, anyway, uh, probably in both ways, anyway, um, I'll never forget the first day of high school when they met my older brother. They didn't know him yet, and they met him, and one of them came right up to me and said, you know, because the bullying was about to end. He said, is that your big brother? He's like, you bet it is. That's what fasting does for us. <laughs> it invites even more than our big brother Jesus to show up on the scene and say, yep. When the enemy comes in like a flood, you bet this is who's on my side, right? Yeah, amen. Amen. Which let me just say this, the last piece here um, is fasting can bring greater spiritual sensitivity and power. In Acts 13, 1 1 through 3, it says this. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Mannion, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Isn't that how you want to live? Yes. Isn't that just beautiful? In the midst of praying and fasting, God begins to speak. Now, understand this. The power is not in the practice of fasting. Practices, spiritual practice is not what brings the power. And fasting is no different than that. The power is in Jesus. See, because many people that don't call themselves Christ followers fast... And there are benefits to fasting. You can fast, and there are benefits outside of what we're talking about. But when it comes to a relationship with Christ, the power is in Jesus. We set ourselves in a place where we open ourselves to the work of the Holy Spirit, to the sensitivity and power that only God can bring us. See, fasting brings us greater levels of access to the Holy Spirit's activity, voice, promptings in our life. You do know that God does not hear better because you're not eating, right? Fasting doesn't help God's hearing, but perhaps fasting helps our hearing and our sensitivity. One of the things that I love to do is I love to, I love to walk in the yard late at night because I love the quietness of it because there's so much noise and even around our eating and our appetite and the things that we do. And there's nothing like being in that quiet space where you can be more sensitive to things that you don't even notice. That's what's happening here in Acts. Things that God was probably trying to communicate with them many times over, but suddenly they became sensitive to that. So we're going to invite you to stand, and um, maybe you didn't go back to the back and see these little cards to take a picture of, or maybe you noticed that there were stones in the back, and um, we didn't tell you what to do with them yet, but a few weeks ago, we talked about holding the stone 
Um, Desmond Tutu gave us that practice to try to hold a stone for four hours and realize that that you might be carrying a weight in your life and sometimes you hold it so long you don't even notice it's there. Or you might notice that you're really, your hand, I did it, my hand started cramping up so bad. Um, I, you know, I got scared to continue the practice. And, but it spoke a word to me. Some of us are holding on to some things that we'd like to fast for the next 40 days. And it doesn't have anything to do with food. Um, let your imagination be given to God right now. You know, just things that are, they're weighing you down. You know, they're, they're holding you back. And so you might want to write on one of those stones what your intention is over these days, what you'd like to let go of in this season of fasting. Um, and, and so we offer you these ways because we believe that God speaks. For the next four minutes, we're going to be in the quiet with this song playing that invites God to speak to us. And you can take a walk to a light wall, light a candle, go back to the back, take pictures of these, um, get a stone, whatever you want to do. We're going to do it in the quiet. We're not going to talk to one another. And we're going to pray for God to speak to us. What, what is it time to fast? might not be food for you. It might be social media. It might be where you go with your fingers on your computer. It might be many, many things. Fill in the blank. What is God asking you to let go of today? So together as our friends walk around this room or stay in their seats and listen, we welcome the work of your Holy Spirit. Speak, O oh God, in your presence I am humbly bowed. Speak, O oh God, I am longing for a word from Wow. 
So stand with us today, and we are grateful, God, for time, that throughout this week we would have so many moments to turn our eyes toward you and to let go of the things that are really fading. We ask, God, that throughout the week that this would be a time where our eyes would be opened. For those who need physical eyesight, those who need the eyes of their heart opened, open our eyes, God, we pray. This week be filled with God's glory and grace. Amen. Bless you guys. See you next week. <laughs>